So I want to invite all the children who are worshiping with us to join me up at the front. I know some of our younger kids are staying home, which is understandable. So I'm going to especially invite those with a last name of Sumrall or Hansen to join me here at the front. Come on, guys. You can do it. No one else is <laughs> there we go, and I'm going to talk a little bit to the camera, too, because I know we have some folks joining us at home. Excellent. Thank you all. I really appreciate you joining me here. All right, so today in the church calendar is actually a Sunday known as Baptism of Christ Sunday. And a lot of churches, we're not going to do it in worship, but a lot of churches are going to read the story of Jesus' baptism and maybe remember your own baptism. Um, and Andrew, if you choose to go to Sunday school, you'll hear the story of, of baptism. But one of my most favorite parts of that story is after Jesus is baptized and he comes up out of the water and, this, and the people, Jesus and everyone gathered, hears this voice. And you may actually know what the voice says. It's a pretty popular story. But the voice says, this is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Now, in one sense, that is the voice of God speaking to God's son, Jesus, right? Letting people know how beloved Jesus is, that God is well pleased with Jesus. But in another sense, that voice is really talking to all of us. And that's why I love that story so much, because every time I hear it, I'm reminded, oh yeah, I am a beloved child of God. God is well pleased with me, and with you, and with you, and with all of you. God is well pleased with all of us, God's beloved children. And I think sometimes as we move through life and life gets hard or challenging or disappointing or whatever, sometimes it's hard to remember that. So it's important every now and that we stop and we remember, oh yes, I am a beloved child of God, right? No matter how things are going right now or what I'm experiencing, that is always going to be true. I am a beloved child of God. God is pleased with me. So to help you remember that today, I have a heart sticker for you. Oh, yes, I do. I know that um, folks of your age may not be as into stickers as maybe some of our younger kids, but that's okay. I'm going to give it to you anyway, all right? A heart sticker for all of you. Oh, that's really a great idea. I was going to put it on his shoulder, but he suggested his hand because that way you can actually see it, right? It's on your shoulder. You can't. On your forehead. It's sort of like where I mark you with ashes on Ash Wednesday, but... And then what I was going to do, Ben, I know you're helping with Sunday school today. I actually have all kinds of heart stickers. And as part of Sunday school, there's always a time we call the work time for the kids when they get a chance to sort of just react to the story or offer their own expressions of the story. And so I was going to hand these to you as all kinds of heart stickers to use during work time. Now, you may or may not have a Sunday school class today, but hold on to those and we'll use them at some point, all right? So that's just to remember, with or without a heart sticker in your hand, we are beloved children of God. All right, go in peace to Sunday school or back to your pew or wherever it may be that you're going. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. The first scripture reading this morning is Exodus 35, verses 20 to 29. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Then all the congregation of the Israelites withdrew from the presence of Moses, and they came, everyone whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing and brought the Lord's offering to be used for the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the sacred vestments. So they came, both men and women. All who were of a willing heart brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and pendants, all sorts of gold objects, everyone bringing an offering of gold to the Lord. 
And everyone who possessed blue or purple or crimson yarn or fine linen or goat's hair or tanned ram skins or fine leather brought them. Everyone who could make an offering of silver or bronze brought it as the Lord's offering. And everyone who possessed acacia wood of any use in the work brought it. All the skillful women spun with their hands and brought what they had spun in blue and purple and crimson yarns and fine linen. All the, women's, all the women whose hearts moved them to use their skill spun the goat's hair. And the leaders brought onyx stones and gems to be set in the ephod and the breastpiece and spices and oil for the light and for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women whose hearts made them willing to bring anything for the work that the Lord had commanded by Moses to be done brought it as a free will offering to the Lord. This is holy wisdom, holy word. And our second reading comes from the letter of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the first eight verses. Listen for what Spirit is continuing to say to us gathered here and gathered wherever we are. I therefore, prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when Christ ascended on high, Christ made captivity itself a captive. Christ gave gifts to his people. This, too, is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. When the church finally decided to close its doors, to move in with another congregation because it couldn't support itself anymore, it issued a modest bonus check to their pastor. He'd served his whole career there to that point, and they'd, they'd never been able to give him a raise of any kind, and so it was the least they could do. The check bounced. When a family went to visit a church for the first time, a church that didn't have money troubles, at least not to that degree, they found their way to the sanctuary, which is always a big step, coming to a church for the first time. And they, they settled down on a pew and tried to get comfortable to figure out, hey, what this church was all about. And that's when one of the longtime members came up to them and said, you're in my pew. <laughs> when the senior pastor wasn't preaching and the associate pastor was preaching, if she picked a certain hymn, he, this isn't us, by the way, <laughs> he would not only not sing it, but he would um, come down and sit in the front row and pout out of, out of uh, disagreement with the hymn. And part of the reason she picked the hymn was to goad him. <laughs> when this church in the historic building in a, in a large urban area, couldn't keep up with the maintenance of such a big structure. All they could do was surrender little bits of the building a piece at a time. So as the leaks would come, they would just give up on one more room and close it off. And slowly they cordoned off different sections of the building till all they had left was a, a sanctuary that was somewhat broken where they would huddle for worship to do the best they could. All of those are true stories about unhealth in the church. And I'm telling you, they are the tip of the iceberg. 
All of them are pre-COVID too, so it has nothing to do with the pandemic. Now I can start to go into statistics about the state of the church too, but I don't want to invite any more death into this room. Instead, what I want you to do is look around. I know it's tough to do on a day where about half or maybe even less than half of what we would normally be because of this new uh, spike in COVID cases. But even in your mind's eye, maybe even over the years, picture people with whom you've been in fellowship through this congregation or look up to the rafters, which are not leaking. <laughs> Do those stories sound like us? No, no. Westminster is a healthy, vibrant, spiritual community. Now, it feels a little braggy to say that. That's not what Christians should do. But it's important to say that. The church has a big messaging problem in the world because of what people assume about us. One of the reasons we fixed up this building was to signal to the community that what goes on in here is alive, it's vibrant. We say these things about ourselves because, not because we're perfect or better than others, but because we are alive and the Spirit is doing wonderful things here. That line, Westminster's a healthy, vibrant, spiritual community, is the first line in our Christian identity statement. Not a mission statement, because before you say what you're about and what you're going to do, you have to know who you are. And we're trying to get a little more clear about who we are so that we can better guide our work in here and better signal to the community out there that is so hungry for healthy, vibrant, spiritual communities what we are and what we're about. So each week, over the next several weeks, we're going to explore a line from that identity statement. So today, healthy, vibrant, spiritual community. Again, not because we've got it all together, but because we're, we're trying, we're alive, we're mixing it up. Again, I could talk in terms of metrics and statistics and money and all that. I can't tell you how many churches are within a month of not being able to pay their bills. Well, yes, we have a debt to tackle on that building, which we will do in this next year. We have our own challenges, but we are nowhere near the state of so many places. Just, and if you want to go into numbers, if you're having trouble sleeping, I'm happy to walk you through that. <laughs> I'd rather talk about health in terms of people and stories and the spirit that's at work here. So I'd like to tell you about when, on, in the six o'clock hour, I'll show up for uh, work on a Sunday to find somebody already here who doesn't work here. After hand rolling all the sandwiches for a congregation wide meal, he's cutting them in the quiet light of the kitchen to get ready for that feast. Or to tell you about the countless people who've had all kinds of success by any measure out in the world, and, and as many options as you can imagine of how could they spend their time and their resources, and yet they give it here because somehow they know that here matters and makes a difference. That's a sign of, that's a sign of health. Or I think of the woman who would come every Sunday when men would spend the night here on Sunday nights because they didn't have anywhere else to sleep that was safe. And after, not only would she have a meal with them, but she'd stay after and she'd talk to them and she'd learn their stories because part of helping people recover their humanity is to allow them to have stories in someone who knows their story. That's health. That's vibrant. That's spiritual, I would say. You all know what a healthy community looks like from the many worlds in which you interact, and you know what unhealthy ones look like. And part of our goal here is not only to, to celebrate what we have, but to build upon that to make this as healthy and vibrant and spiritual as we can. So we say that about ourselves, not because we know everything, not because we have all the answers, because we don't, and I hope we don't come off as if we claim that we do, but because we carry our questions into the life of faith, which is where they belong. And in fact, sometimes it's the questions that make us as faithful to Jesus as anything else. Jesus, who asked plenty of questions on his own, and those help us better emulate, embody his way out in the world. This is hopefully a place where you can find people who have similar values and think like you, and hopefully a place where you can be challenged in how you think, in a way that's constructive and healthy and not abusive. It's a place where you can feel good when so many times in the world you're made to feel bad for who you are or what you aren't or what you can't be.
And it's a place where you can feel broken and not be ashamed of it. I know of at least one person who comes here in part or felt welcomed here in part because it was a place where she could sit in the back week after week and cry and not have to answer a bunch of questions about it. That's a part of welcoming too. It's not just, not just greeting people, but giving people space. It's a place where you can find authentic relationships and try to do this thing together. And in a world where everybody wants to just go do their own thing, that's a pretty remarkable statement. Healthy, vibrant, spiritual community. When, when I was looking at this church and this church was looking at me, the, one of the chairs of the search committee said, you know, we're just a happy band of campers. And uh, you know, it seems like such a superficial line, but I have to tell you how refreshing it is to be in a church where people like to be happy. My wife says this all the time. She said, you know, they just like to be happy. And I shouldn't tell you this, but that's not a given in the church. <laughs> so many places reflect their dour, heavy architecture with the architecture of their souls and of their relationships, right? And I don't experience that with you. You all uh, like to laugh, hopefully at the right part in the sermon. <laughs> But there's joy. And joy is a spiritual trait. I mean, think of the great masters. Go outside our tradition. Look at the Dalai Lama. Have you ever seen him? He just giggles half the time. His teaching isn't that elaborate. He says, be kind and have compassion. And then he giggles. Think of what he's seen. His people were violently removed from their land. He can't go to his own homeland or the homeland of his people. He's seen all measure of suffering and injustice, and yet he dares to laugh, right? He's not ignoring things, but he's connected to something that gives him joy. It's a wellspring. I think um, part of what makes a, a community healthy is not just who it is, because we always have room to grow. We know we could become more of, uh, than, than we are. We could uh, be more deeply grounded in the spirit and improve in so many ways. But it's not just who it is, it's to whom it looks. As a carrier, as a vessel of sacred wisdom, as somebody who really embodies the way of Christ in a deep and lasting way. That's a sign of health too, who you're striving to be, striving to listen to. In this past number of days, we lost a giant in that world one that deserves our attention today and our reverence. It's rare in this day and age we can find anybody to agree upon, but this is a person who inspires, at least today, almost universal appreciation and gratitude for, someone who brings a smile to everyone's face. In this divided time, someone we can agree upon, Betty White. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. At the first service, nobody laughed. and I. I wanted to see how you'd respond to that. I mean, I guess she was a groundbreaker in her own way. I mean, we've actually, we've lost, even in the entertainment world, doesn't it seem like this last two weeks? Good grief. Uh, whether it's John Madden or uh, Betty White or in maybe in a little deeper sense, Sidney Poitier. Think of what he endured and made room for. Uh, I was thinking of another giant we lost recently, E.O. Wilson. If those of you who follow the, the scientific world, E.O. Wilson was called the father of biodiversity. You, anybody know what he studied? He was the world's leading s student of what? Oh, you got, oh, you got it, ants? You, you were there too. Yeah, we had one at 832. Ants, he's the world expert on ants. And through his work with ants and other biology, he was, again, called the father of biodiversity, which is actually kind of a spiritual thing because biodiversity says we are who we are through the existence of diverse others. That's how a healthy system uh, exists. Powerful. Could have talked about him. But, of course, the one I really want to point to today who deserves our time in the church of all places is Desmond Tutu, of course. Right? This powerful figure who stood with others against the evils of apartheid, a biblically justified 
spiritually justified system of injustice that separated people based on color and ethnicity. And think about Tutu. What was his book called that detailed the relationship he had with the Dalai Lama? The Book of Joy. Joy, that man, that world, joy. Powerful, right? I want to share with you just some snippets, some quotes and just some teachings that he gave to us as a gift because we can't spend the whole time tooting our own horn. We have to spend part of their time remembering to orient ourselves to the masters who can help us retain and grow as a healthy, vibrant, spiritual community. Tutu was a giant in terms of the concept of forgiveness. But forgiveness is often misunderstood in the church. It's sort of sold as just, a, oh, you just always forgive and you don't, without any consideration to anything else, and it becomes kind of a, a superficial characteristic, but it was much deeper. Tutu um, said there's no future, at least in his context, without forgiveness. Meant he knew the world was stuck, and the thing that would pry them loose was radical forgiveness. But he, he said this, he didn't understand forgiveness to be condoning injustice, or to be escaping accountability, but forgiveness is refusing to pay back the oppressor in his currency. It will not return violence for violence, evil for evil. When co-creating a way forward in the midst of apartheid, Tutu and others of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission realized they had to make a choice about how to break free from the deadlock of that injustice. And on the one hand, they didn't want a Nuremberg-style set of trials that would work exclusively through a legal system of correction. But they also didn't want to just grant blanket amnesty, amnesia, just, well, we'll just let it all go, because that does double violence to the victim. What they decided was they wanted reconciliation that was based on truth. And so the people who were still living, who had been hurt, got to come forward and tell their stories of hurt in the presence of those who hurt them or represented systems who hurt them. They wanted reparation, but not retaliation. They wanted understanding, not vengeance. And Tutu recognized this was not just good politics or good negotiation. For him, it was grounded in something deeper. It was grounded in theology. Because what he said was, it was good theology that allowed me to make the case that we lived in a moral universe. Healthy and vibrant spiritual communities have good theology at the core. Right? The stories we tell are sound, they're evolved, they're mature. You'll never find a healthy and vibrant spiritual community that does not have good theology. You'll find big ones, You'll find successful ones, but they won't be truly healthy. They won't have actual vibrancy. They won't really be affirming in a deep sense if they're not based on good theology. Churches love to follow the latest fad, whether it's in programming or in technology, but the ones that are really re rooted in the deep story of the goodness that is permeating the universe and trying to transform the universe, they've got no chance. Otherwise, they're just embodying an impoverished ethic. Tutu said this. He said, we are human because we belong, which is not the same as I'm human because I think. I think, therefore, I am. I am because I belong. Belong to something greater. Christian uh, scholar Diana Butler Bass, who writes about church stuff, says that we have to flip the typical formula in the Western Christian world that says, you believe like us and you behave like us, then you can belong to us. She says, no, we need to create spaces where people can feel a sense of belonging, a safe place to be as they are. And then together we'll behave some ways together, which isn't brainwashing. It means we'll do some things together. We'll pray, we'll worship, we'll serve the poor, we'll work against injustice. We'll do the kinds of things that Jesus would have us do. That's behaving. We'll do those things together, and out of that, that'll inform our own behavior, and our beliefs will organically form. 
right? Belong, behave, believe. We flip the script. That's why when I said that slogan last week, that this is a place where you can find community, grow spiritually, and better the world, the first is find community. And I know we have work we could do there, but we have some good things going and we can build upon that, recognizing that all too vital need. To do reminds us we must do that because that's how people become human. They belong to something. Find plenty of people who are not human who've achieved plenty because they don't belong. Along those lines, Tutu wrote this, a prayed in church is qualitatively different from one that has the atmosphere of a concert hall. And this, after all, is a house of prayer. First and foremost, it's a house of prayer. During the capital campaign, we raised money to build and uh, fix and expand the building. One of the pieces of the program that was prescribed for us was to have a 24-hour prayer vigil. And in uh, so many words, there were some who scoffed at the idea. Well, we don't do that kind of thing here, right? The evangelicals do that. But we did. And if around the clock, two in the morning, there was somebody praying here for this church. It was one of the more powerful things we did, if you ask me. And if you don't believe that a space is, is qualitatively changed after being prayed in, and this space doesn't convince you that, go to Green Gulch and sit in their zendo, where people meditate, I'll call it prayer, all the time, and have been for years. Or when my wife and I were back in Philadelphia working, when we were not uh, on for any given Sunday, we would go down to the Quaker Meeting House down the road in Haverford, where, which had been in operation for 400 years. And we would sit in that room where, where people had been holding prayerful silence every week for an hour. You could feel it in the walls. You could feel it. Prayed in church is qualitatively different. Unless we misunderstand Tutu as sort of syrupy or just sentimental, which is what we do to our prophets when we don't have to hear the hard stuff, is we just, we just shave them down till we make them palatable. He was fierce too. He was fierce in his love and in his joy. He once said this, quote, I'm not interested in picking up crumbs of compassion thrown from the table of someone who considers himself my master. I want the full menu of rights. Whew. Strength in that love. Speaking of rights, he was a champion for LGBTQ rights which is far harder to do, was far harder to do in his context than it is to do in this one. And he once said, when he dies, if, if he gets to heaven and it's homophobic, he will ask to go to the other place instead. <laughs> yeah, that takes courage. And like Elie Wiesel before him, the great Jew, Tutu condemned this, this, what I will call a strange affinity we have for neutrality in some facets of the church, as if that's a spiritual virtue to always be on the sidelines. And he said this, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen. You've chosen the side of the oppressor. He says, if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse, and you say, you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality. These things and more we can take from this great, right? This beacon of light as we endeavor to become our own modest beacon in this sometimes foggy climate. And our tradition is full of these places if we would but search for them there. That, that reading that Susan offered earlier is this marvelous image of a healthy, vibrant spiritual community. Because what are the people doing as their hearts are moved, as they feel they belong, they bring their gifts to bear. I hope you brought your goat hair and your yarn. But it's lovely in its particularity because it's what they had and it's what they could use to make something beautiful. It's the ancient version of the greening of the sanctuary where the whole community comes and they build the faith community with the gifts that they have. It's gorgeous, right? Many of you have given generously of your gifts to this community, and if you haven't, you'll be asked to. Because we have no shot if we don't all build it together. No shot. 
The Ephesians passage, likewise, talks about gifts at the end. People give according to the gifts that Christ gave. And it says, we are to leave, lead a life worthy of our calling, of being people who say we follow him, with gentleness, with humility, with patience, with bearing one another, all in love. Those are the marching orders for a vibrant, healthy spiritual community. But what we're looking for is that golden thread that, that wound and bound those like Desmond Tutu and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission together to get through difficult times. For them, it was the African concept of Ubuntu, which simply means my humanity is inextricably bound up with your humanity. Another way of saying it is I'm human, through your humanity. So in that sense, E.O. Wilson wouldn't have been a bad choice today. Because what it's saying is, my existence can only be through our shared existence together. A biodiverse existence. So let us celebrate who we are. Use it to build, to become even more of what God is calling us to be and continue to grow deeply in touch over these next few weeks of who we say we are so we might dare to live up to it. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. I do encourage you to take a look at the back side of your bulletin and the many different events that are happening here in the life of the church. Uh, just to highlight a couple, um, immediately following worship, you're invited to our Finley Hall for a time of coffee and tea and chance to have conversation with each other. And then following that, we have a special requiem ritual happening today. This was actually first experienced by one of our congregants at Grace Cathedral. And it was so moving to her that she came back to us and said, you've got to bring this to Westminster. And so the day is today, a time of ritual to remember those who have died over these last two years of COVID. And you may uh, participate in the ritual thinking of a, a specific person or specific people, or you may participate in the ritual um, just holding all of those who have died in the last two years, but I do invite you to, to join us in, in Finley Hall following our fellowship time. I think Tina, who's leading it, is here. Yeah, there you are, right there. She's, she's going to be, be leading us in the ritual. Just thank you for being here with us, and we look forward to being with you in a little while. Uh, the celebration of Epiphany was January 6th. That's when we celebrate the Magi who followed the star to visit the baby Jesus. Uh, Rob has put together a great video for all ages uh, to celebrate Epiphany. It's up on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. If you haven't gotten a chance to check that out, I do invite you to do that. Uh, as we have mentioned, we have many congregants who at this point are choosing to worship from home, which is great. However, it may, we do still need things like ushering and lecturing and Sunday school teachers for those who are here. So. You all are here, uh, which means we would love to use your gifts and talents if you are interested or willing to help us usher, lecture, Sunday school teach, all the things that go into making Sunday morning worship happen. Just let one of us know. You can catch us after worship or give us a call or an email. We would, we would love your participation in that. And then Rob has a special announcement for us. Yeah, and before mine, Tina, did you want to say anything to the group here or... Yeah, why don't you either come up here or just project from where you are? Yeah, good. People like the mic. Come on up, yes. <laughs> Probably better coming from you than one of us, since you're the... <laughs> I did my best. There you go. Oh, well, well, actually, well, you come use, all the way up. Yeah, use the mic, yeah. And then we can really hear you, yeah. All right, is that good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Tina Rath, and I'm an artist here in the Bay Area. And I started this project that I'm calling Requiem, um, about a year ago as a way to, for me, as well as an offering to you, uh, to help us make sense of what has happened over the last two years. There's been a lot of death, obviously, but there's also been a lot of anxiety and anger and fighting, which for me comes from the ambient stress and the ambient trauma that we've all been living under and living with, whether or not it's affected you directly by having a loved one pass or you yourself have had COVID, I've experienced both. Um, anyway, so this project, it's a massive project. I intend to draw a circle for each person who has passed. The circles are drawn in gold ink gold because I believe we all illuminate brightly even after we pass from our physical state. And by doing so, we provide this very simple meditative prayerful act of compassion to recognize that the people who have passed, they are not just a number which we heard daily for a very long time and we're continuing to hear, but these people have been our parents, our grandparents, our partners, our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, for some, our children. Mm. These are real people with real lives. And I believe that in order for us to move forward, as you were saying in your such a beautiful sermon, that we come together in a community and it is through this coming together in a community recognizing the humanity in another being that in this way, we will move forward. We can't just get back to normal and pretend that this didn't happen. This is not gonna be good for us as a community, for us as a humanity. And so I invite you all, 
after the service today to come right back into that room over there and we'll draw golden circles. I have everything you need, no previous experiences <laughs> necessary, no artistic sensibilities whatsoever. It literally, you're drawing a circle. And what the most beautiful thing about this project has been is not just that it gives us this opportunity to come together and to sort of move through a meditative process, a prayerful process, but when the drawings are finished, and I have over um, 200 drawings finished now. They're 50 by 72 inches. They're big. Multiple people draw on each drawing. And your drawing of your circles is like your fingerprint. Mm -hmm. And so the drawings themselves become a rich tapestry of our humanity coming together rather than staying apart. So I invite you all to come after um, worship this morning, and thank you for having me. Well, thank you in advance for being here. And she brought, she's not kidding, she brought everything. These are, we didn't spend any resources on this, so we owe a great debt of gratitude for the artists in the midst of us who help us make sense of the larger world in ways that perhaps other disciplines cannot. The last one I want to offer is, we are hoping to offer a pilgrimage of sorts this spring. It'll be not, a, not where we go from one place to another, but we'll set up kind of home base at Zephyr Point Retreat Center uh, right on the shore of South Lake Tahoe. And then we'll do day hikes every day. And the, the advantage of that is you get a, a, a warm bed and a hot shower at the end of the day. But also we can offer varying degrees of difficulty. So those of you who want to get out and do some more rugged things and others who need a more gentle walk, we'll try to have options for, uh, for folks throughout the week that, that uh, do that. It's from May 30th to June 3rd. It is Memorial Day weekend, but it's the weekend we could find, or it touches that weekend. Uh, the thing is, there's a non-refundable deposit that's pretty sizable. And given the uncertainty of all these times, we need to get a certain level of interest before we're willing to front that money that we may lose. So you're not, I'm not asking for anybody to commit today or in the next coming days. But if you're interested and those dates work for you and you think there's a better than 50% chance that you would go, please tell me. So, because uh, if we have a critical mass, we'll go ahead and leap. Uh, but if we don't, we'll say not for now, okay? Either is okay, but we need to know. So again, that's May 30th to June 3rd. It's not in your bulletin because we didn't get that hammered in time for the printing, but it will be in subsequent e-newses and bulletins. So again, uh, it'll be a mixture of of, of hiking, of spiritual practice, of dwelling with the sacredness of the earth, of sharing our stories and growing in community. It does not need to be limited to church people, okay? Um, it's something that would be, I think, quite inviting even for somebody who's not in a traditional church, okay? With that, let's rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn. <laughs>
Friends, as you go from here, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is Father and Mother of us all, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. Amen.